<clears throat> now to get into my story. God, people are, some people are going to hear me pissed. My wife's not here. Is she? Um, turn the cameras off. The video's off. Um, February 2016, so February last year. Test, test, D-ball trends. <laughs> Got to be me. This is going to be the first time I've ever presented sitting on my ass. I wasn't planning on speaking. I was just going to come up here and say, hey, thank you guys. And I want you guys to give a round of applause to Joe and Alicia because they did an amazing job putting this on. <clears throat> then I was going to say thank you and just send your ass out of here. But I, I want to tell a story that I've been contemplating telling since October. And some of the people in here know parts of it. Some know other parts of it. But nobody knows all of it. And as I was taking notes throughout the day, I think I can use this to drive home a lot of the takeaways that the presenters have spoke about today. The weird part about this is it's kind of stupid shit. In a way, I kind of feel like I'm up here, like I'm sitting in front of AA or NA. So I need to start with saying my name is Dave Tate and I'm a fucking meathead. You know, just to kind of put some context behind where this is going to go from here. So I'm going to start with some myths that I, that I picked up just today. First off, Mark was saying that, the, that we landed on the moon and that the, earth is full, uh, that the earth is round. Obviously, he's not doing his research because according to Facebook, that's fucking wrong. <laughs> you know, another one was a lot of the guys were making fun of Instagram. I train with a pro bodybuilder that thinks it's the best thing that's ever happened to training. Why? Because if he films a set and it doesn't look good or the lighting's fucked up, he's got to do another one. So it's the best way to increase training volume <laughs> that's ever been announced. The, the third myth, it's, it's not what was presented today, but it's something that I want to put out there because we did have doctors present and there's a lot of talk about rehab and there's a lot of talk about therapy, recovery, and so forth, that I have a lot of narrative about with people that I know, other fucking meatheads. <clears throat> I hear a lot of times, I mean, I can just do a, a raise of hands by this. How many times have you heard somebody tell me doctors don't have a fucking clue if you're a serious lifter? Be honest. All right, what about the same thing with physical therapists? All right called physical, I mean, Buddy was talking about personal trainers more or less, but, you know, physical terrorists and all this other kind of stuff. Here's something that you guys need to realize. They're not full of shit. They all know what they're doing. You have, you're, what you're requiring from them when you go in as a meathead, as I did in 1990, is assuming that they're going to trust you. So you have to earn their trust before they're going to say, before they're going to even comprehend or speak to you about stupid shit like sticking needles of saline in your leg. All right, you go into a doctor right away and say, hey, yeah, I've been sticking fucking saline in my peck. He probably doesn't want to fucking see you. You don't know who he is. He doesn't know who you are. You have to build trust with the doctor and the physical therapist over a period of time if you want to embark on doing stupid shit like I've spent most of my life doing. And then they will... I'm not going to say they're going to say you it's right, but they'll help guide you, but it's not going to happen from the start. Do you everybody understand that? You know, they, they have licensing issues. They have all kinds of other issues that they have to worry about. Plus, they don't know who the fuck you are, you know, so you don't know who they are. I've been seeing, I ruptured my pack in 1990, and I've been seeing the same physical therapist since 1990. When I moved to Columbus, you know, I went through several doctors, then ended up with Eric, unfortunately, but have been with him since 1990. You know, I didn't walk in his office. That, well, I did, but I shouldn't have. You know, walked in his office saying a bunch of stupid shit. It takes years to develop that trust. So don't just assume if you're trying to find a doctor that's going to help you and understand why you're a fucking meathead. Don't assume that's going to happen on the first visit you have to earn their trust. And that's the same with the physical therapist. 
they can help you tremendously. All right? And it's a better source than some fucking dude on Facebook that you don't even know is licensed to even touch you, which is a whole nother conversation in regards to that. So those are three myths that I wanted to address before I get into my, you know, Meathead Anonymous story. So let's go back to, I had my left hip replaced in 2013. I don't want to go into details about all that. At that time, I was told that my right hip needed to be replaced as well. It wasn't symptomatic, so I said, fuck it. We're not going to do anything about it. I was told not to do anything about it. So I kept in all the restrictions that I had as far as range of motion, you know, that I felt were adequate to be able to keep the joint healthy for a longer period of time, knowing that it was going to have to be replaced at some point or another. With that in mind, I learned a lot about joints and wear and tear. And I learned that a lot of people will preach mobility without even fucking considering what the joint health is. So if you're bone on bone or your joints plagued with bone spurs that are grinding into the labrum, that, need, that shit needs to be fixed, you know, for one thing. But if it's not symptomatic, you can still, you know, keep plugging away with it. But it's wear and tear. So if you're going to do 800 repetitions of fucking leg swings, feel right, go right ahead. But those are 800 reps that could have been fucking something cool, like squatting. <laughs> you know, so I had to find other ways to warm up the, the hip, the natural hip that still wasn't fucking replaced to extend the life of the hip. So just to throw quick things out, I don't want to go into detail about any of this. I learned that loaded stretching just prior to threshold was amazing for keeping the joint range of motion. Slow eccentrics with very submaximal weight was amazing for the muscle inhibition to be able to keep the range of motion neutral which with the hip, it was already reduced. But the, the trick there was how to not make it get worse. Those two things far exceeded any of the mobility shit I was doing. So there's more to how to warm a joint up and how to prep a joint up than mobility, which some of the guys presented today. You wanna look into all those things, especially the older you get. The older you get, and I say older, and when I say that, I'm speaking age in some contexts, but training age as well. Your joints start acting up, get the fucking x-rays. Don't go online, actually don't go online for any fucking medical advice. Go to a doctor. Um, but especially with that, get the x-rays. You have to know, you have to have somebody look at the x-rays and the MRI. I'm fucked up, my joints are fucked up. My shoulders needed, needed replaced in, shit, Eric might know, like 2005. You know, he sent me to somebody, he said, you're fucked, it needs replaced. I said, fuck you, I went to somebody else, he said, you needs replaced. <laughs> fuck. You know, so, you know, I'm not doing that. I've already had two surgeries and uh, shoulder replacements don't have a good success rate. So at that point, it's like, okay, fine, how do I keep this pain free and still be able to do a lot of the things that I want to do? I can't grab a squat bar, I can't touch the bar on my chest, but I can shoulder saver press and I can yoke squat like a motherfucker. All right, so how do I remove the things that are damaging and painful? How do I keep the joint where it is? So it doesn't get worse, but it's probably not gonna get better either. That was 2005, and it's still not symptomatic. All right, so there is ways to prolong the surgery. The, upper, the lower body is a little different because you fucking, I don't walk on my hands. You know, so the, the hips are a little bit different because you walk and I'm fat. So there's, there's more force, you know, to go with that. All right, now to get into my story. God, people are, some people are gonna hear me pissed. My wife's not here, is she? Um, turn the cameras off, the video's off. Um, February 2016, so February last year, my hip started to become symptomatic. This is the other one, the one that it's, it's replaced now. It was replaced five weeks ago. So if you don't know anything about that, long story short, they break your leg, cut the femur off with a fucking jigsaw, drill a hole in the femur, put an implant in there with the femur head, 
put a cup in there and stick the shit back together and tell you to go home. So that's kind of how it goes. There's no turning back because they cut the fucking thing off. So that happened five weeks ago. So that's why I'm sitting on my ass right now. I don't want Eric to yell saying, why were you pacing back and forth ranting? So how I'm going to rant on a chair, I'm still trying to figure out, but I'm doing all right. Um, anyhow, in February, when I went to see my orthopedic, he did the x-rays. It was symptomatic. It was running down my leg. It was in the glute. It was in the groin. It was the same shit that I had before. I knew what it was. He said it needs to be replaced. I said, can you just shoot the shit out of it? I said, just, hit, just shoot wherever you need to shoot. Just load it up with cortisone. I never used cortisone, by the way, when I was competing. It was taboo. I never wanted that shit because it's going to wear your tent. Everybody knows the negatives of that. I'm almost 50. Fuck it. I don't care. Shoot the shit up. It's going to be replaced anyhow. So he shot it up. Now, why did I do that instead of not opting for the surgery? I'm a meathead. I wanted to break a PR. And to me, a PR is not what Facebook, Instagram, and everything else is. I have about 10 PRs in my fucking life. There's 10 things I have PRs on. That's it. It's the most I've ever lifted. Fuck the weight class. Fuck the grip. Fuck all that. That's the PR. I wanted, to, I wanted to know what it felt like to break a PR one more time. And I came back and broke a PR with every injury I've ever had, every surgery I've ever had, except the left hip replacement. So I wanted the shots because I wanted to find a way to break an all-time PR. Uh, this gets stupid. I understand the stupidity in what I'm saying. But you got to understand, I'm a fucking meathead, and this is how meatheads think. With this in mind, I have to enlist help. So when I do that, I, I first establish the objective. So we've heard today you have to have a purpose for your training, correct? So I establish the objective. What am I going to do? What is the, what is the lifts going to be? What is the PR going to be? How am I going to go about doing that? Well, I know yoke bar squats, reverse band presses. I know max effort exercises that I've done in the past and when I was at my strongest. I decided on the spider bar on the same box I've been squatting on for the past since the other hip replacement. So say three inches high, two inches high. Um, it's higher than 90 degrees. Safe for the hip. So that's what I was going to do. Why did I decide on that? Well, we heard today that with your programming, you need to take safety into consideration. I wasn't worried about my safety because the hip's going to fucking get trashed. I was worried about my spotter safety in case my leg broke. So if I used a yoke bar, and th this is the logic that went through my head. JL will fucking attest to this 100%. If I use a yoke bar, the plates are higher, right? Everybody know what a safety squat bar is? The plates are higher. Do you know what a spider bar is? It's a cambered bar. The plates are lower. If something breaks and I got to dump it, the plates are closer to the floor. Does that make sense? It's safer for whoever's spotting. Logical. It's also easier to catch because it's at their waist instead of up here in case something happens at the top. This is shit I thought about all right, when setting up the lifts I was going to do. This is also why I've never written about this. I don't, I don't even want to be talking about it now, but fuck it. I'm in it. Um, <laughs> I never posted about it. Go through my training log. Go through my blog. You won't see shit about my training for the past year. Well, it's because of this. The other reason why is this was very fucking personal to me, to be able to break an all-time PR. It's been a long time, and it meant a lot. So I didn't want the distraction of posting. It was, I can't explain the depth of what it is. It's hard to be able to understand. So the first thing was to set the objectives, which I did. And then I had to find people that I, I would consider them enablers, okay? <laughs> so I'm not going to list their names, but I, I, I only told three people what I was going to do. And these three people, they're friends of mine, and they're enablers. They will take the journey with me. You know, Ken had the chart about the edge in the red zone. They'll take the journey with me to the red zone and be supportive and help me with what I want to do. And if I fall off, they're cool with that. They'll just laugh if I fucking fall. I would for them too. But they're not going to say, no, don't go in the red zone. They're going to say, motherfucker, get there. And 
I wanted those enablers. I needed accountability and help from them, but I didn't want the other group of people that I'm gonna talk about later, the realist. I didn't want them right away because them fuckers would try to talk me out of it. So I didn't tell them. I didn't tell them for four or five fucking months. Because when this started, I was in bodybuilding shape. I trained with Meadows. So doing stupid volume bodybuilding shit, it only does so much, right? Well, that's all I've done since I had the other hip replaced. Now I had to convert into a strength phase, which means that I had, I had to get to what I call the starting line. You can't just go from hypertrophy training into maximal strength training. You have to have a starting point to where your aerobic base is ready to recover from the demands you're gonna put on there. You have to have a base of strength to be able to move forward without getting hurt. So that took a couple months to be able to get to the starting line to where I felt, okay, now I'm at a place where I can start. And I tested the lift and it was fucking pathetic and it was shaking all over the place. And I honestly didn't know how in the hell I was gonna get to where I wanted to get. And I had a time limit. I didn't know when the quarter zone was gonna wear off. And at the same time, it still fucking hurt. So it wasn't like the cortisone solved everything. It took a little bit of the edge off. It still fucking hurt. And as I got to the starting lane or starting gate, some people started to figure out what was going on. Then I got into the phase of, all right, I got the phase of the, the real training. I'm biased in my training views. So it, it's gonna be concurrent training, but I knew I had to also drop my bias because I had to have maximal results in a short period of time. And what we were talking about was a stretch. I don't want to put the numbers out there, but it was a stretch for me to do this. And I wasn't really that sure I was going to be able to do it, but I was going to try, but there was still doubt if that was going to happen. So the training cycle, I started through the training cycle and everything was going well. And then fuck, I couldn't recover. And I went right, right back to what I used to do 20 years ago, sled dragging, you know, the, the upper body sled dragging, concentric only work, all the stuff that usually works for me. And it worked for a few weeks. And then it's like, fuck, my hands hurt. My, why is my wrist hurt? It's like my wrist, my hands, my elbow. It's like my recovery work was killing me. It's like I, the other stuff was working, but my recovery work was drilling me. So... At that point, I'm fucked, you know? So I went to see Louie, because I figured there's one guy I know is more fucked up than me, <laughs> you know? It's Louie. And I knew if I went to see him, I didn't have to explain, I'm trying to break an all-time PR and a fucking spider bar high box. So just think about that for a minute, all right? And a reverse band press with a fucking shoulder saver pad. All right, I didn't have to, there was no, it was like, yeah, okay, cool, he's fine with that. Within five minutes, he gave me two exercises. The guy's a fucking genius. You know, walk around on a tire, you know, and do some bent over shrugs with a fucking wheelbarrow. So I start doing those, bam, my recovery is right back on pace again. Things are moving through. And then I get a text from Fathead over there um, that says, hey, I think I have something that can help you. And this would be JL. He didn't tell me what it was. He knew, I just kind of called him out as being one of my enablers, didn't I? Um, he knew what I was doing, all right? So, and he knew the struggles I was having, you know, with shaking and stuff like that. He didn't even tell me what it was. I just go, all right? He can help me, I'm there, all right? I get there, fuck, I don't know if he's gonna give me a book, a magazine, a fucking, uh, I don't know. He says, lay on the table and starts beating the shit out of me. <laughs> now, keep in mind, he's talking about this RPR. The RPR he does now isn't what he was doing to me. <laughs> it, it, he worked on like one person before me, and I was the fucking guinea pig. It didn't just hurt. It fucking hurt. And it didn't stop. It was torture. And so when he's working on me, I'm like, okay, this is like some kind of fucking therapy. This is usually one hour sessions. So I'm looking at the, I'm fucking crying. I'm screaming. I'm trying to like be hardcore about it, but you can't because it hurts so fucking bad. Then I'm like, well, at least it's going to stop in 20 more minutes. Fuck no. This shit went on for like two hours. 
And, you know, people are, you know, I hear these people, yeah, I had the RPR, I felt fucking great afterwards. I went home and fell the fuck asleep. <laughs> I passed out. I mean, I was fucking hurt. And then there's the, the wake up drills, which are a big, big, big part of this. So I go to the gym that night and it was supposed to be a speed day for me. And I did the max effort work on that Sunday and it was a fucking disaster like they all were. And so I'm doing the speed work. I'm like, geez, this feels really good. Fuck the speed work, throw plates on. So I start working up and I'm like, holy shit. I just did 90 pounds more than I did four days ago. So I called JL and I don't know what the fuck I'm supposed to think because it really hurt. And I'm trying to decide, should I do it again? <laughs> because this really helped. And this definitely is going to help me get that PR, but it really hurt a lot. And so I'm, I'm thanking him, but, and he's cracking up while I'm telling him this because I'm trying to talk through him to decide if I want to even do it again. But the PR was so fucking awesome, I had to. All right, so part of my training, the whole training cycle had to be auto-regulated. And that was discussed, Buddy discussed that a little bit. I am a huge proponent on you need to learn, if you train, how to auto-regulate everything in your training, from warm-up sets to top sets to exercises. If you're a coach, you need to learn how to teach the athletes or the lifters how to do this themselves you can't put a fucking workout on or training on a piece of paper and say do this because if they go do exactly everything that's written it's a fucking disservice because anybody that's lifted for a long period of time i'll use max effort work as an example if you're true conjugate and you know max effort work the main goal of max effort work there's sub goals, but the main goal is to strain, bottom line. That's it, to strain. There's sub goals to be able to strain for time, so to be able to strain and think. But the goal is to strain, okay? If you're working up and you're warming up and the shit doesn't feel right at 135, 95, whatever it is, you have to change to a different exercise. You stay with that exercise, you're going to fuck yourself up. Maybe not that session, but it's going to start to accumulate. You need to bail. So you're either going to bail to another exercise or you're going to bail completely and do belt squats or something like that. That's the first decision. Actually, the first decision on max effort work is what to do. The second is, is this the right choice? The third is as you work up, you want to try to break your PR by five pounds. As you're working up, it gets to a certain weight. You realize I ain't going to break that PR you gotta take a sidestep and break a triple. So there's three decisions that have to be fucking made with a max effort exercise, but if it's on paper, work up, max out, good morning squat. Where's the decision making process? Because those two things are very, very important on what's being done. You program directly out, it's bothering the person's knees, they work up, they max out with it, knee comes in, they strain their knee. That's unnecessary. They could have completely bailed. All right, so I was cool with the auto-regulation. I got that down packed. I've been doing this shit for a long time. Where I was having problems was the actual week-to-week -week cycling. So JL and I came up with our own version of how to determine that. So I'd see him, he'd beat the shit out of me, and then based upon what he'd see, he'd say, you're at a nine, which told me, fuck it, go hard. You know, go as heavy as I can, or you're at a seven. Fuck you. But I stayed at the seven, all right? Because that's what my body was telling him. So we did that for the, the remainder of the phase and was able to do what I wanted to do as far as the, um, as far as the goal of that. So the, the, the key thing there is the other thing that I learned more last year through this stupid process then I've probably learned about training since the first year I was with Louie. And from what I learned from that was recovery. I've always known it was important. I always thought Louie was doing three fucking extra workouts a day because he wanted to show us up. I got older and more beat up. I realized, shit, 
I have to do a workout six hours before the workout just to be ready for the workout. Then I have to do a workout the next morning just to recover from the shit I did the night before. Then I have to do another workout. So they're all tiny, tiny, mini workouts. You know, band work, walking on the tire, just recovery type stuff. And then the passive recovery. This shit up here is mine. I got more, I got fucking ultrasound, I got everything. You know, the passive recovery. I learned that you can't stay with the same modality. You have, I had to change it every week. So percussor one week, dolphin the next week. Um, uh, ultrasound the next, stem the next. You know, I, I changed it so my body didn't, because it, we, a big theme today was adapt, be, adaption. You know, nutritionally, training. Well, recovery, that's the same thing. I never thought about that because when I was competing before, I was younger, I wasn't as fucked up. So I could just do the sled work every, you know, couple of times a week and recovered fine. My aerobic base stayed set, you know. Now I wasn't able to because it was beating me up. So I had to rethink it, shrink it, and do it a lot more frequently. So now I know why Louie was doing 21 workouts a week. At the same time, the other thing I learned was it took 21 hours a week of training. I don't want to do this shit again. You know, so because of that, I learned what the actual physical demands are for an athlete at a higher level that's beat up. So a lot of you guys that are working with top athletes, you need to keep this in mind. It's more than just the main training sessions. They have to be able to recover from those things. Younger people with a lot, with not a lot of experience, not nicks and dings and surgeries and shit, they, they, they really don't even need recovery work. They're gonna recover on their own. You know, another story which throughout this process, because it was a box, I figured if I gained, and I was gaining weight anyhow, because I was in pain and the cortisol, it's, it's an interesting thing when you have to have a joint replacement because you just start gaining weight for no reason and I don't know the science behind that, but I'm like, fuck it, this is perfect. If my ass gets five inches bigger, the box just became higher. Because I'm not adjusting the box height, you know, so I end up being 316 and bloated as hell. And the pain was always there. If you watch the Table Talk videos, the reason why my eyes were always watery and red is I was in constant pain. But I wasn't feeling it as much because of all the recovery stuff. But basically, the way to explain it, my insides were fucking bleeding where my outsides were tolerating it because I just got used to it. But... What happened was, when I talked about the realist, Eric, I'll, I'll admit, is one of the realists. I'm trying to avoid him at all costs because I weigh 316 and he's gonna ask me, what the fuck are you doing? I've, I've heard it so many times. So I'm doing a great job avoiding him. And we have this little mini underground training session. And I pull in the parking lot and he's in the, f he's there. He's in the parking lot, and I'm full bore bloated. <laughs> and I'm like, fuck, I have to, fuck. You know, I, I have to be here, but I don't want to, and I can't avoid him, and he's going to see me, and this is not good. All right, so I try to, like, duck past him real quick. And I kind of got away with it, but he caught up with me at the power rack on the far end of the gym. And he starts laying into me, you know, what the fuck are you doing? I'm like, look, man, I don't want to explain it right now. You know, it's, we'll, we'll talk about it later. You know, I had an appointment to see him that Monday. And he's telling me, you ain't fucking coming to see me if you're like this. I'm like, ooh, shit, he's pissed. <laughs> and I'm like, damn, you know, so I'm, I'm trying to, like, get myself out of this hole, but it's kind of hard when your head's the size of a balloon, you know. And then Meadows is there. And John I, we, steps up, and I swear to God, he quoted verbatim the speech from Rocky when he's trying to get the commission to give his license back. You know, he's telling Eric, you know, Dave's got something in the basement, you know. It's, it's in the basement, Eric. It's in the basement. You know, he's got it, and I'm trying my hardest not to laugh, but it's fucking working. So I'm like, okay, this is cool. It's in the basement, you know. So, so am I lying? It's Total truth. This is why I don't want to write this shit. I, I go to his office that Monday and I get the realist talk and I 
I signed a contract basically saying I'm never going to do this again, which he just pulled out of my ass in the hallway because I said I wanted to be able to squat 750 by the end of the year. So he took a picture of the stupid thing. So it's, I wrote this thing and he takes a picture of it. Basically, I said I would never do this again. And the reason, in my mind, and as I told Eric, I will abide by what I wrote because the reason I wrote it at the time is because it was taking 21 hours. And I did become the person I used to be 20 years ago when training was my number one priority, above family, above everything else. And I don't want to sit here and say that's a bad thing. It's a real thing. So if you're working with athletes, you need to understand that if they flick over and that becomes their number one priority, they're not looking for reasons why they can't do something. They're gonna tune that out. They're gonna fucking ignore it. The only thing they're gonna hear are things that validate why what they're doing is right, okay? And that can, it's damaging, you know, to personal relationships, family relationships. And I've been there in the past and I didn't wanna go there again. So I did tell my wife eight weeks out, there's a really good chance I'm going to be a total fucking dick. And I was. And that's why I signed the contract from that. So the takeaways from all this, oh, there's one, there's one more takeaway, which I still don't understand, is I did what I wanted to do. And I pushed it. You know, like the next week, I'm like, fuck it, that felt real good. You know, I'm going to work up and see what I can do for a triple. So I worked up and did a really heavy triple. And oh, fuck, did it hurt. You know, and by this time, I'm already duct taping my hip because it's fucked up. D fuck the kinesio tape. Duct tape. Way to go every time. <laughs> you know, nothing holds that shit better than duct tape. I had it on my fucking forearms. You know, I had it on my groin. Ask the people that train in the gym. Did duct tape everywhere. Fucking my knee, my groin, my forearms, my head if I had to. Um, I forgot where I was going with this. Oh, so I pushed it. Then I go in to see my enabler you know, which is JL, because everything's fucked up. So he's testing me. He's like, dude, what did you do? Because you're fucked. I'm like, well, you know, I went up and did a heavy triple. And then my enabler fucking flipped on me and became a realist. <laughs> and said, dude, you told me this was your goal. What's the point of you doing this now? I had no answer except I'm a meathead. But he didn't go for it, so I quit fucking seeing him. Um, no, I went into a couple, I mean, we got it fixed back up, but an interesting thing I can't explain is four weeks went by where I just went back to stupid training because the surgery was already set. And after the four weeks went by, I got that itch like, man, I just, I wonder what I can, let me squat because I haven't squatted at all. Just stupid bodybuilding crap, trying to build the stabilizers to be ready post-surgery. So I start working up with the spider bar again and broke the, broke the PR by 50 pounds. I'm like, no, wait a minute. I lost fucking 25 pounds in the past month. I haven't trained the squat once, but I just broke my record by 25 pounds or 50 pounds. And my only reason why that happened is I would have been just as content with my leg breaking as I would have been with doing the weight because it hurt so bad. It was cramping at night. It was, it was awful that if my leg would have broke, that would have meant I would have had the surgery that next day. So I eliminated every bit of fear and every bit of anxiety because honestly, probably breaking it would have been better, you know, in my mind. So that made me start to really wonder, you know, when somebody is training for maximal lifts, when I was training for the goal that I had, every week was a little bit reserved mentally because I'm looking for this number on this day. You see what I'm saying? So I didn't want to do anything to fuck that up or to hurt it. But now on the other end, it's just kamikaze land. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying that there's some untapped shit that we may not know about, or maybe it was just a gift from God for all I know. All I, I, I can't go back to try to break it to find out because I signed a stupid contract. But I don't know if I, if I really could. So the takeaways that I wrote down from all this is with training in general, life, whatever it is, you need to have a defined objective. You need to know what you actually, what the purpose is, what you're doing it for. Anything that's outside that purpose, don't do. If you can't 
If you have a training program and there's certain things in there, you don't know why they're in there, get them the fuck out. There's no purpose. If you can't define the purpose, get it out. If you're doing extra workouts, you can't define the purpose, stop doing them. All right, don't do shit just for the vanity of doing shit. Have that defined purpose. That was a, I knew this, I've always known this, but when you train like a bodybuilder for freaking eight years or whatever it was, you forget that because there's not that end, here's the defined purpose. It's, oh, I'm training to get fucking jacked. What the hell does that mean? You know, it's, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, I bleed powerlifting and strength. So the body, but I don't, you know, I don't get it, you know, so I, I'll do it. I'll go back to doing it. I enjoy like challenge sets and stuff like that and pain, but there's nothing like hit, lifting a heavy fucking single. You know, that, that's, there, there's nothing like that. To me, there's nothing better on earth than standing up with something you've never done before. Um, so you got to have a defined objective. Find enablers. As fucked up as it sounds, Find enablers. Find people that are going to support what you're doing no matter what, okay? You need those people because there's enough fucking critics out there. Have those enablers that are going to have your back. They still have your well-being in mind. Yes, they're going to laugh if you fall off the cliff, but they're going to go down there and pick, a, pick you up, but you're going to fall in. You know, they may jump in with you. They're going to be there, but they're going to, they have no problem with you falling off the cliff. So find, find enablers. At the same time, you need to find the realists as well. Because if you just live off the enablers, I did that for many, many years when I was competing, shit is going to go awry. You know, you're going you're gonna to get fucked up. You need realists that are going to be able to step in to say, look, you have other priorities. You know, you have a family. You, you're going to die. You know, whatever it's going to be, you have to have those people. And they have to be strong enough to call you out on your own bullshit. Because if you're as good as I am, I'm really good with my bullshit. And there's only a few people that won't buy into it. So you have to have those realists as well. And this training, it, all, it, it pertains to everything, training in life. Always look for what the starting line is. You know, if you're training or whatever it is, just don't jump in the fucking pool. That's stupid. All right, if you want to start a business, you got to establish what's the starting line. What do I need to do to be ready to move forward? Don't move forward unless you're ready and conditioned, mentally prepared, educated enough to move forward. Too many people jump into shit. We got people in powerlifting now that just do a meet. They don't even train for it. They just do the meet. That's stupid. They're, that's not even a representation of what the sport is. The sport's about training for something and the meet would be that reward or, you know, pissed off day, you know, but the meet is not the sport. So find the starting line and condition yourself for the starting line. Then after you have that starting line and you're, you're ready to go, fucking go. None of this 60%, 70% fucking go and get it done, except nothing I had no fucking idea when I went into this how I was going to manage my shaking issue. It, I st anything over 600 pounds, I, I shook like a bitch. I mean, it, you could hear the plates from two streets away. It was, it was bad. And I had no, that was always my limiting factor, is I would shake. And I didn't, this was part of the last five years of my career. I never solved the problem. I went into this one knowing this is my limiting factor, this is a problem, but there's gonna be a way. I knew it, I knew there was gonna be a fucking way. I didn't know what it was, I just knew it. And it happened. There was a way that came, you know, with JL beating the fuck out of me, right when it had to come. Because the next weight jump I was gonna have to make was gonna be in my shake zone. And it was gone. So it was there because I believed it was going to be there. I didn't go into it thinking, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, everything over 600. This is more like this fucking PR matters. I'm gonna do this no matter what. Whatever gets in my way will be solved. If I don't know the answer, it will show itself. That's what I mean by fucking go in with 100% positive focus. You're going to do it. 
All right, that was another takeaway that I got from most of the presenters today. Recover and adapt. Recovery was a theme over and over. I've already spoken about that as far as what I had to do. I can't underemphasize the importance of that. When you're younger, you take it for granted. When you're older, you need to take that. You need to learn it. You need to study it. You need to talk to other people. You need to know the difference between passive recovery, active recovery. You need to know when the recovery is too much. You'll get sore. You should never get sore from your recovery work. You need to know when the recovery is optimal and you need to understand the recovery is just like training. You have to rotate it. You have to cycle it. Don't let yourself adapt to it. The last thing is something that I learned from a text from, from Eric a couple weeks ago. And the surgery was fine, I suppose, but my leg was a balloon, so I was stuck in a chair for four weeks, and I've only been moving for a couple weeks now. You know, as we're texting back and forth, I don't know what I said, but he sent something back that said, you know, you're finally starting to learn from other people's mistakes. And it's true. You know, while I sit there and will tell everybody else the mistakes that I've made and hope that they would learn from the mistakes I've made, until recently, speaking to Eric, I realized I've never learned from anybody else's mistakes. I'm the guy that makes, I make my own. So I'm the guy that if somebody says, hey man, taste this, it, this tastes like shit, taste it. I'm the guy that tastes it, <laughs> you know? You know, they do the stink palm with the beer, you know, here, does this smell funny? I'm the fucking guy that will smell it. Well, I'm starting to realize maybe I don't want to smell that shit no more. Maybe I don't want to eat that shit no more. Maybe I just want to rely on the people that I know and, and learn from the mistakes that they made. And it's taken me 49 years, but I'm to that point now. So I can speak, Buddy spoke about wisdom. I can speak about wisdom that if you can walk away with that one lesson, it will make a significant difference. It's hard, you know, if you're a meathead like me, it's really fucking hard because, you know, if, if someone rams their head in the wall and says it hurts, you want to know how bad it hurts. You know, so learn from other people's mistakes. And everybody presented today was presenting from a standpoint of experience from making mistakes. They're not up here talking about the mistakes they've made. They're up here talking from a reference of what they've learned from all the mistakes they've made. Each one of them have made far more mistakes than they've made successes. So understand that. So actually, in my own admission, in my own guilt, I did myself a huge disservice by not listening and learning from other people's mistakes. And I owe Eric a debt of gratitude for saying that to me, but at the same time, I wasn't ready to hear it until he said it. So you always want to be there in their ear, even if they don't hear it the first, second, third, fourth time. I've been seeing him since 90, you know, and he's made a significant difference in my life multiple times, but it never stops, you know. So with that, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, appreciate your time and wish you all the best. Thank you.